Good morning and welcome everyone to a Bevington Group webinar. And this one's on leadership resilience. But before I start, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land from which I am broadcasting or narrowcasting. That they are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So if you haven't attended one of these before, but I believe many of you will, the, we cover a broad range of subjects to do with essentially operating model, process improvement, transformations or change, and the leadership that's required to get all of that done. Now, this particular presentation is actually by popular request. We did one of these um, during the COVID, COVID dark times, where we were all locked away in our homes and we weren't quite sure what was going to happen. Um, but I have been asked to do it again. I've been asked many times to do it again. And the presumption is, of course, that times are still challenging. And even if they weren't, leadership resilience is actually a very useful subject. So this is somewhat updated um, and restructured. And there is some new perspective on this. Uh, but nonetheless, it's the same subject. But we're going to fire away. Now, for those who want to essentially... Uh, take notes just to let you know that we will distribute the slides post the event so you will get asked them or to be precise we'll direct you to a link on the Bavington Group website. Now one thing we should say is that there is a Q&A screen at the top or bottom of your screen depending on how you've actually structured your setup on Zoom and you can ask questions there. I'd have to say what tends to happen though is we don't get a lot of time for questions at the end, but far away, and we'll try to get back to you post the meeting um, if you don't have the opportunity to hear an answer during the session. All right, now um, I should actually start with introducing myself. So I'm Roger Perry, I'm CEO of the Bevington Group. Um, and today we will be covering the topic of leadership resilience and we'll cover it essentially in two parts across these six, se six sections. We'll talk about the important part of looking after yourself. So what do we know about resilience? And um, we'll refer to a lot of text and a lot of thinkers, but this is a very practical way to think about it and direct you so some interesting resources. So it'll be from managing ourselves and there'll be some deeper dives into reframing, integrating reframing into other techniques and then um, using some of those techniques um, as a leader when keeping your teams psychologically safe through challenging times and psychological safety is quite a subject du jour and it's actually very important uh, as we now have from the research for creative open and um, highly effective teams okay so the hypothesis behind holding this presentation or this webinar so yep okay so we last did this at COVID. things have got better there's no question with regard to COVID, um, but we still live in a world with challenges and there's a list on the left. So we still have inflation. Good news is it looks like it's ameliorating. Um, that's fabulous. We still have occasional supply chain disruption. It wasn't that long ago, only a matter of weeks that we had port disruptions. And um, we still have disruptions um, through some major ship shipping routes. Um, regulations increasing. Technological change, particularly AI and data science, almost demands adoption. That's the way people describe it to me, particularly, particularly boards. It's as if it's a demand that's being placed on them by the world. Um, industries are still having some problems finding qualified staff, even though we do have increased migration. Many of our clients are actually reporting a product productivity decrease um, since COVID. There was a spike initially. Now, this actually is spotty and it is variable. So... Um, some functions are actually just fine, other functions uh, not so fine, and there's some interesting research, which we'll cover at another time, on working from home and productivity, and that might be a special subject later on, bringing people up to date on the latest of what we know about working models, and we now know a lot. There's a lot of research on that. Uh, feel free to put something in the comments if you think we should actually do a webinar on that. So, which takes us to the next subject. There's not actually a final resting pace for some, if not any organizations on the hybrid model. And uh, we have major demographic shifts happening um, as uh, we have people leaving the workforce, retirement happening, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just for us. 
on our customers, our cost of living pressures, housing pressures, increased incidence of anxiety since COVID, AI make increasing gains and gains and, and demanding some sort of answer, I suppose, as to how to adopt it. So we still live in VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, or TUNA, the other, the other acronym, turbulent, uncertain, novel, and ambiguous. Okay, so that's the context. Now, one of the interesting reflections that many writers have had and those who are examining where we are today post-COVID um, with a world which has some very unfortunate tensions, wars, um, supply chain disruptions, inflation, increasing poverty gaps, um, is that to respond to that, you need to be match fit. And one of the questions that writers like Crawford ask is, are we actually in a world that's helping us get match fit? And this is important context because Crawford says and publishes widely on this, but in particular, it's a book called The World Beyond Your Head. Um, and essentially what Crawford's saying is the world actually bombards us with stimulus. Most of it's unimportant, but it's incredibly distracting, takes us off the focus on that which is really important. And it's actually it's actually worse than that. It actually effectively burns out some long-term focus circuits. So the appification of society makes this work. So if we're always bombarded with stimulus from our social apps through to our emails, through to the phone being never off, this leaves us less time and energy for that, which is most important to make progress, focus attention. So to the extent that our teams and our sales and our organizations, our families, our friends need focused attention, we've got less of it. And essentially, as hypothesis, we're developing shorter attention spans. This will damage our long-term ability to maintain focus. It can damage our ability to cope with stresses, and it may be reducing our general, genuine ability to interact with human beings. Now, why is this important for resilience? Why is the absence of really developing um, ability to pay attention to things um, over sustained periods of time? Well, it actually decreases our resilience prima facie by decreasing our problem solving abilities. You're more resilient if you're in good mental shape to solve the problems with which you're faced. If the problem goes away, there's a reasonable chance that'll help you actually feel better, reduce your stress. By the way, it's not the only thing and it might not, but it'll, it certainly won't be unhelpful. It'll reduce our ability to interact socially, which we know absolutely is important for our long-term health, even our short-term health and our short-term resilience. And if we buy the argument you are what you attend to, then our attention is serially put in the wrong place. It's not being put where it needs to be. So whilst, so essentially the concept here is, yep, we're still as leaders thrown an awful lot of challenges and there's an awful lot of noise in our context. And the noise in our context reduces our ability to focus on serious problem solving and gets actually in the way of relationships which are important for resilience. So what we're going to do is basically talk about ways to address the stresses and challenges that we face as leaders. Um, we're going to actually, therefore, on the way, address here and there that issue of attention um, and actually giving yourself the space to solve problems. The more stressed you are um, in the long term, if it's bad stress, the worse you are at solving problems. But we'll come to that. Short term stress can be fine. We'll review personal resilience through a lens of Nicholas Taleb, though. So what do we mean by resilience here? What we mean when we talk about resilience is more what Nicholas Taleb talks about when he describes anti-fragility, which is a concept that he's introduced and written about. And essentially, the idea is if you experience a stress and rest, a couple of other factors, you can actually get stronger. Your teams can get stronger, your organizations can get stronger, and your body can actually get stronger after stress and rest. So that's the way we'll see it. Um, and we'll take a view, therefore, taking a leaf out of Nicholas Taleb's book, that the challenge that you faced is a way to get stronger. And this is a form of perspective shift. And if any of you have read or listened to Ryan Holiday, who's a very famous um, webcaster, writer, uh, social media personality and indeed probably mainstream media personality net now and he talks about stoicism but he's got a great deal else there and um, you might have heard that particular phrase he actually has a book by that name 
Now, these provide for us a way for us to think differently about our challenges, respond productively to our challenges, find ways to pace ourselves to the challenges, and actually keep solving problems effectively in the long term, and then keep our teams together. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're then going to talk about how to apply some modern scientific lessons to the management of our teams in that sense. Okay. So managing ourselves over the long haul. So underlying, underlying and fundamental proposition under this is you've got to look after yourself to be able to look after others. So um, how do you keep it together? Well, well, one thing you could do just to start is to pause for thought and figure out where you are in this four quadrant wheel. So, and you will actually send this presentation out of the link to so you can pause and take a screen print. It's quite handy to have in your pocket. Are you in the performance zone? Are you challenged, optimistic, confident? Are you in the recovery zone? So you're stressed, you really lent into something. You've got a result or not. And we'll talk about not in a few minutes time. And you're in the recovery zone. Or are you in the survival zone, the dark side of performance stress? You're defiant, annoyed, frustrated, angry, biting at people, frustrated and after enough of it in burnout. So if you are on the left-hand side, you, you might need more immediate action and a pause to be able to get yourself more into the right-hand side. And we're going to talk a little bit about pauses in a few minutes' time. So being self-aware is generally considered a good idea. So pausing to see where you are is good. Now, notice in this, and this will be a theme, um, stress in senior leadership is definitely a theme. Stress is not all bad. And in fact, there is plenty of evidence, and we'll come to shortly, that those who see all stress as bad are worse at dealing with stress, which is really interesting. So, and that's because you can reinterpret stress as the positive style of stress or even excitement. And that's one of the coping mechanisms, interestingly enough, but still you have to rest. Okay. So basics, we're not going to talk about this much. You can find lots on this elsewhere. Um, this is a, a little bit of unique packaging we're going through here, but you can't actually talk about resilience as an individual or even the resilience of your team without the basics. Um, exercise is a superpower, just is. It's good for you. Do it at your own pace. Don't go too hard. Don't break yourself in the process. Be sensible. But yeah, it's it's part of the mix. Social contact, we're absolutely sure is part of the mix. It's good for your short-term mental health. It's good for your long-term mental health there's an increasing probability it helps um, with things like the um, avoidance or slower onset of dementia. It's just a good thing to do. Um, so a diet is important. Don't think you need to say much about that. And of course, rest. The, one of the things I find ironic about rest and particular sleep is there's so much on it available on the internet and in social media and in the press that I think people worry about it so much it actually disturbs their sleep. So there is a way to deal with that. We won't cover it now, but uh, don't worry so much about it. You disturb your sleep. It's one of life's ironies. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is reframing. So stress as a leader or even as a team member, actually as a human being, or a feeling that you might be under threat and you're in a state of heightened alertness is inevitable. And the good news is it's not all bad. And that's important to realize because we do know that if you see it as all bad, you'll try to avoid stress. And those avoidant behaviors lead to all sorts of other problems. And it's unrealistic to expect to avoid it. You're going to have it, right? So it's, what do you do about it? So firstly, it's important to understand that not all stress is bad. Good stress is associated with a lift in job performance. It's essentially the feeling of excitement that allows you to perform at an enhanced peak. It's a bit like before you um, engage in something really important, that little elevation in attention and focus that you get, that almost narrowing of attention, and there is a narrowing of attention, might actually be helpful. Indeed, often is. But bad stress um, is associated with burnout, plummeting of performance. So think about long-term fear, and it definitely has grinding down. So longer-term persistent fear, which is what stress really is a form of, um, is bad for performance. But the issue is not the elimination of stress because you actually can't avoid it. The issue is managing it. You can reduce it. And we'll come to lots of on that in a moment. But um, the idea is you stress and rest. And by stressing and resting, you become stronger. You build mental muscles. But there are also skills and techniques to practice to reframe stress itself. 
but bear in mind that the attempt to entirely avoid stress might not even be futile, but might actually be counterproductive, which is what Donald Robinson, who's a very famous psychotherapist and philosopher, and points out that there's plenty of evidence that that's the case, um, and points out that there are better strategies. And we're going to come cover some of them today. So we've all got this. Um, leaders are certainly have it, but your staff have it, your teams have it. And of course, they'll be bringing stresses in from their home lives and personal lives inevitably in to their work life as well. Okay. So not all stress is bad. In fact, some of it improves short-term performance. It's worthwhile be bearing in mind because then you won't get stressed about being stressed, which is laying one stress on top of another. And being humans and able to reason, we can actually fall into that trap. So one of the important things then to realize about stress is that stress can actually build us. So there is, particularly if you get a rest afterwards, there is a place for stress in terms of building people. And this is one of those ideas that hard times can in fact be used to our advantage. And that's true of individuals, teams, enterprises, organizations, and indeed families. So Talib, Talib's research points out that you can be stronger physically or mentally and even emotionally by being stressed and then rest. And this is the biggest challenge for you. How do you find the time to pause and actually get some low stress time to allow recovery, to allow your stress to actually be a net positive over time? Um, so it is like building a fitness and muscle group. So if you are actually training for an event, training in any way, just to build muscle, just to be fitter, whatever you happen to be into, the reality is that rest is required. You don't exercise all the time. So rest is important um, as the stress. And in, in essence, we are going to review a couple of ways to tone down the way you interpret the stress. And then we're going to talk about some of the rest stuff. So the practice of managing stress goes back to the practice of managing how we think. This is a very old tradition um, in human literature. Um, Socrates has something to say it. Um, ancient Roman philosophers had something to say it. And modern psychology, which, by the way, um, really does work. I mean, modern psychology is really um, expanding in leaps and bounds um, in many of its capabilities of dealing with problems and challenges um, through its techniques. Um, was actually founded on many of these philosophies. And the idea is that basically, to quote Shakespeare, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And by thinking about the situation you're in itself, um, you can actually reduce your stress by thinking differently about it. So this is Albert Ellis, um, who established something called the Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy School. And he said that too many people are unaware that it's not our outer events or circumstances that will create happiness. It's our perception of events and ourselves that will create or uncreate positive emotions. So, and there are a couple of other quotes here. Seneca, the famous Roman, and people are not affected by events, but the view they take of them. Now, this is the ancient practice of essentially reframing. If you think differently about a stressor, you might actually reduce the intensity of the stress. And actually, by thinking differently, you might have a much more realistic view. And in fact, that is usually the case because one of our unfortunate characteristics as humans is to potentially catastrophize. So um, a little tip I got um, at university. So uh, actually my first degree before getting into um, computer science or design and process re-engineering um, and, and hence indirectly into my current role um, was psychology. And uh, one of when we were learning some of the fundamentals of this, we got three very simple pieces of advice. The starter for 10 as to how to build mental resilience when faced with the constant barrage of stresses that you can often face, reframing. We're going to go into more on that. A sense of humor. Now, we're not going to discuss here about how you develop a sense of humor, but developing one, that's a superpower. Um, laughter really is brilliant at shutting down some of the stress circuits. And it doesn't matter whether you're cracking a joke yourself or you're uh, watching a particularly good piece of comedy or you're reading something amusing. And the good news is you can actually develop your humor muscle. It, it's actually something you can consciously do. Some people are naturally more attuned to that, but you can actually develop it and have a plan. So having a plan 
and actually doing something about it works. To have a plan, you need that problem solving ability and then we're looping around again to stress again. If you don't have um, long-term stress, you're managing your long-term stress, ironically, you're more able to develop plans more frequently. Your attention, back to that first issue, that we talked about from Crawford is actually better. And then you're more likely to reduce your stress further and you're into a virtuous cycle. So uh, managing your stress and having a plan are very much related. Okay, so keep talking about reframing. Let's have a think about how some of this works. Here are some suggestions. Graham Jones, who writes on performance and resilience and often addresses um, athletic examples, but not necessarily the case. Um, they don't always apply to the worlds we live in, but nonetheless, he points out, he advises us to learn to love the pressure, or at least some parts of it. So, oh, this is good. It's good that I'm getting this challenge because I'm going to grow. He does advise you to pause and celebrate the victories. That's important to slot in there because it's actually a form of rest. It's important. You can actually reframe anxiety as excitement. So personally, I used to do competition public speaking. And when I did, I would try to reframe anxiety as excitement. It really helped and you can practice that. Own the challenge. This is a very important one. So if you've chosen your career and your career is giving you some challenge, own that challenge. This is the life you have chosen. Look at it that way. The world seems just a little bit less challenging, a little bit less dark. Even understanding that stress and challenge makes us stronger is a form of reframing itself, recognizing that crucibles of leadership, that tough times can actually help you. And then you can try to do things like develop childlike at attributes, which are a sense of wonder. Now, there are a couple of different ways of doing this. Um, some of it you can practice. So the sense of wonder that you might feel um, at watching a leaf drift to earth on an autumnal wind, that actually sense of wonder at seeing the beauty in nature. Actually, those who can do that and practice that, again, you can practice it, actually just fundamentally live calmer, more tranquil existences because they pause regularly and it's a form of rest to observe that. So it's a form of rest. It's a micro rest. And don't forget um, rest after stress, but you can reframe things in other ways. You can see some of the challenges you face fundamentally as an opportunity are not quite as bad as you think it is um, because and recognize two things. One, it might seem bad, but guess what? Even in the worst case scenario, you'll get through. And if you feel and think that way, you're probably right. You will get through. Um, also, you pause and think that this, you might, a lot of people say to me when they're stressed, ah, this is actually a first world problem. This is not a life and death for me right now. Worthwhile thinking about. Or I can see I can flip this around and turn this problem into an opportunity. And that is actually the subject of a whole book, which I mentioned earlier, which is called The Obstacle is the Way. That which gets in your way actually can make you considerably stronger. So reframe. So seeing the situation as a challenge is something that uh, many writers and philosophers and public intellectuals have talked about. We've got a couple of public intellectuals here. Arianna Huffington of the Huffington Post is a public intellectual and business person who consciously uses um, stoic theory and resilience practices in her day-to-day -day life and is a public proponent of them. James Stockdale was someone who was um, shot down during the Vietnam War, was a prisoner for seven years, um, was subject to torture and was in solitary confinement for four years. And he survived by basically reframing. Uh, Ariana Huffington survives um, a very stressful, high-paced life by reframing and in fact, by practicing much of which we have just talked about. There are plenty of examples of those who publicly do this and, um, and do it very, very well. So, and it is worth saying that through history, philosophers, psychologists, public intellectuals have proposed that our ultimate freedom actually lies in how we respond to challenges. So any event that we're faced with, any challenge that we're faced with, um, you can say to yourself that actually my ultimate freedom is this, lies in the space between a stimulus, something happened, and a response. And this is what Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor, said. Now, he formed a, a way of thinking, a therapy, and a philosophy called logotherapy. He was, and he noticed that 
basically many people who survived the Holocaust conditions thought about things differently. And his conclusion ultimately, amongst a number of other very, very salient conclusions, was to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance was your ultimate superpower. When something happens to it, you can choose how to react to it. And it does not need to be the way that everyone else around you is reacting. So if everyone else chooses to panic, that's not a choice that you need to comply with. You can go your own way. So Viktor Frankl on this is very important. And there are some really interesting modern therapies in this such as acceptance and commitment therapy, which is proving very effective as well. In essentially accepting that stress has happened, uh, seeing your emotion, recognizing that you are not the emotion, and um, and then on accepting the challenge and emotion, then committing to a bigger meaning. Now, we don't have time to talk about ACT today, although it is very, very interesting, and I think we'll see various forms of it in um, various workforce help problems help sorry programs as the years goes up years go on so it's a very good resilience approach so managing the way we think means that we can get ourselves into virtuous cycles as i talked about so you think differently about your, your stress or you reduce your stress you think differently about the stress itself you reduce your stress to a manageable level you have time and space to solve problems because you have time and space to solve problems. You're more effective at solving them because you're more effective at solving them. You give yourself space to rest because you rest then in solving the problems and dealing with the stress as you get stronger. You're better able to deal with the next problem and so forth. It also helps you avoid, that's a virtuous cycle, but this thing on the screen is a vicious cycle. And this is a classic example of a vicious cycle. And it can help you break these vicious cycles because you're managing the way you think. There's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So you might, um, you know, you don't exercise and you maybe eat more. You feel bad about yourself for not exercising. You come demotivated because you feel bad about yourself. You don't exercise. You feel bad about yourself again because you feel bad about yourself. You don't exercise and eat more. So uh, you want to break those cycles to get to your objectives. All right. So a lot about reframing because... Um, it's important. It's actually you deciding to manage yourself effectively. Um, we'll come to managing other teams in a few minutes time. So a few things that are essentially honorable mention. So there's a gentleman called Martin Seligman, and he essentially is the father of the modern positive psychology movement. And he's actually turned his mind to resilience because this is a theme. It's not just a COVID theme. It's been a theme beforehand, particularly as the pace of change um, increases and it's an increasingly popular theme to consider in corporate life and definitely in our space um, because of essentially we're in the job of helping our clients change things um, and that has inherent stresses. So um, basically in turning his mind, he has a program that's got three broad components, building mental toughness, especially reframing. We have been talking about reframing because it's something that you can get good at with practice. Now, all of these things are practice. Signature strengths. Are you actually aware of what particular signature strengths you have to solve this problem? And if you need different signature strengths, where you can go to get them amongst your teams. So signature strengths. It's really useful to know where your signature strengths are. We all have things we're better at it or not so good at. Um, and strong relationships. So this is where relationships in teams matter as well. It is, of course, family, friends, social clubs or groups that you belong to. And, and often we find that we don't have time to really engage in that, but it's actually quite important. And strong relationships in your team. Does your team have your back? And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes time, because as leaders, you can help foster a context where you, you do actually have each other's back. And that really helps. So basically, Seliming's big three basically mental toughness, which is essentially reframing. We've been talking about that. Understand your signature strengths. It's a place of uh, go-to for problem solving, but also knowing what you're not strong at means you know when to reach out and strong relationships. Back to a point we made earlier in the big four for managing yourself, including exercise, diet, strong relationships was uh, one of them as well. Okay. Now, yeah, you can reframe the stress, but at the end of the day, um, if Talib's right, and I'd suggest that he probably is, it's good to have a breather. 
So you'll actually do better. You're more likely to get stronger from stress and more resilient over time, anti-fragile, that if you can stress and rest. Now, the reframing helps you rest. There's no question. You can actually helps you take a break and not ruminate, for example. But let's, and that's kind of what part one of this is about. And this is from Fernandez, who um, wrote an article in Harvard Business Review, which is very, very good. And, and HBR regularly comes back to this subject to their great credit. So you can compartment, compartmentalize your mental load. You can set aside worry time. I'm not worrying right now. I'm in a rest mode, but I'm going to put in my calendar or in my diary a uh, time when I've decided to worry. So this is you're not what you don't worry. You don't think about your problems all the time. You put them aside and you actually plan a time to worry. It's, it's a fantastic thing. Um, and write down where you're going to, when you're going to do it and remember to reframe. So set aside a time to worry, set aside a time to plan and then stop it when that time ends. Take detachment breaks. There's good evidence that a break every 90 to 120 minutes is good for, for performance. So going hard all day without a break is actually probably counterproductive your brain run inside a juice allow it to refresh and recharge and then taking a day off occasionally micro breaks are really really effective mindfulness through the day is very helpful so there are lots of basically programs to help you do mini meditations the meditation is not for everyone there's no question but many med meditations like micro naps um are actually very, very helpful in restoring energy. And there's plenty of evidence that that's the case. So I'm not just talking here, therefore, about long holidays and sabbaticals and so forth. This is about sustaining yourself through your working week, month, six month, quarter, year, whatever, it by, by compartmentalizing, set aside time to worry. Don't worry all the time. Don't let stress leak into your life all the time. Plan to stress within particular time frames. Take detachment breaks know that you've got a working cycle, put in some breaks and the type of break you might consider is learning some of the mindfulness and meditation techniques. They don't take long. You don't have to sit in an ashram for five days. Um, you can actually spend seven minutes doing one in a quiet corner somewhere. So given that's the case, uh, what else do you need to think about? Well, you need to think about purpose. So, and now that we're starting to really blend into what you need to do with your teams as well. So purpose is a touchstone to a healthy mental state all the way back to one of the first books I read on effective self-management um, as a very young fella, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People from Stephen Covey, which many of you have heard about, and Principle-Centered leader Leadership. What are you for? What have you decided is your purpose? Um, what are you connecting to? And of course, then the idea is to ideally connect that with your team's purpose. Now, Viktor Frankl, who I mentioned earlier, one of his other quotes was, those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. So having a purpose is great for resilience. So all of that stress and rest, all of that reframing, et cetera, all of that Seligman's three approaches to greater resilience they're all turbocharged by having purpose. Um, otherwise, you are a little bit of a ship without a rudder, is the theory. And that actually fits into acceptance and commitment therapy as well. Okay, so, so very, very um, limited summary, but let's have a crack at it anyway. So seven things to take away. Remember the basics, exercise, social connection, diet, rest, sleep, plan for it. Just plan for it. Plenty online, for example, about sleep hygiene. I think you probably we all know the basics of good diet and so forth. Please don't beat yourself up about these things. Just get a little bit better all the time if you can. And by the way, progress sometimes means going backwards before making progress. There's a great graph I should have added here on that. Um, it's not always linear or perfectly linear, but you can draw an upward line through a bumpy graph. Learn to reframe. It is a fabulous skill to be able to manage, get close to your purpose, build upon your strength, certainly be aware of them, compartmentalize your worry time, get the right rest breaks, consider meditation, but it's not for everybody in little micro meditations. And remember, you won't be perfect. Don't create getting better at stress management and resilience as a form of stress for you is really what I'm saying here. That uh, ain't the point. Okay. Now, so that's looking after yourself, but I want to actually now spend a few minutes. And so how do you think about this as a leader with your teams? Um, so it's very difficult to get things done by yourself. 
it's much better and easier and much more impactful if you're playing with others, of course. So we're all in teams or leading teams of some sort, and we're probably both in the man leading them from time to time. So I pulled out some of these uh, for us to think about, and you'll see there is a non-trivial overlap between managing yourself and managing your team. So there's so much research on staying connected to the organization's purpose, just as it's important for you. Now, there's two items two and three there are both reframing. So when you communicate to your team, you're connecting them to the organization's purpose, but you're also framing the challenge. So I mentioned Churchill's way of communicating. He used to tell it like it is that it's tough, but you can cope. That was his way of reframing, as opposed to it's tough, woe is me. It's the world's going to fall apart. It's not how he played it. He said it's tough, but we'll make it. Um, and there are other ways to reframe, including pointing out that it'll make us stronger, pointing out that it's well within your capabilities, pointing out that you have redundancy, you have resilience, you have a backup plan. All of those things are forms of reframing. Smile and say the challenge is good. With that challenge, we don't get better. So you're reframing whatever way you happen to do it. And it doesn't have to be some of the ways that I just talked about is part of your job. So, but now you're not doing it with you, you're doing it with your team. So the skills that you learn here are extremely useful. Practice, practice. Show the team you've had a plan. So we said having a plan reduces your stress. It was one of the threes that I was taught as a young lad in, um, in the psychology space. Show you have a plan. So teams prefer there's a, you to have a plan. You don't have to have built it, by the way. It can be a team exercise, but you got it. Keep the team up to date. And people will, as you know, fill a space with things that might not be true when there's no communication happening. Encourage the right basics. Exercise, rest, diet, social connection. I mean, things are emerging like team exercises to do step-a-thons and so forth. It, it, they're good things. Just don't push people into it. Allow people choice and agency. Choice and agency in their lives is very important. And I'd argue you do much better in your culture if you leave plenty of room for that. Great social connection through work. We're at work, even if we're online, a lot of hours. So wouldn't it be good if we like the people we work with and then we provide social support? I don't have time to go into lots of ways of doing that, but there are. Um, ensure people feel the organization has their back. Now, this is probably worth a separate webinar because what this touches upon, it's definitely not the whole thing, is psychological safety. Now, this is extremely important for high performance as a team because um, if you're psychologically safe, for example, you can truth tell about something that's going wrong without fear of reprimand. So you can actually feel safe to suggest improvement ideas. The organization may or may not take up the improvement ideas, but there's value in having them. And even if only one of your eight ideas get picked up, the organization could be a lot better off for them. And often an idea is the beginning of another idea. So much of that requires psychological safety. And um, if everyone's just managing the next marginal risk rather than seeking the next marginal opportunity at the same time, the organization tends to go backwards. So psychological safety is extremely important. And ask each other if you're okay. And you can start with this. So you, if you remember the campaign, Are You Okay?, there's a lot of power in that because you're reaching out and genuinely and authentically um, expressing concern for a fellow human being. So we're not just cogs in a wheel in an organization. We are people. You People aren't just cogs in a wheel. They're people. Um, you get a much better organizational outcome if you happen to do this stuff as well. Um, but, but as it happens, you're a human too. Okay. Uh, this is, I'm not going to go too much into this. There's plenty around him, Churchill's communication style, but fundamentally he told it as it was, then gave the good news you can cope. So essentially he's actually, he was um, in psycho babble, basically encouraging people's belief in their own agency and their own power and their own effectiveness. Yep. It's tough, but we can do this. Um, so very handy, which then takes us to, um, some of the key points of communication and uh, with this we'll start to wind up so keeping it real real so organizations are 
there's, there's a timing thing, of course, in this, you, you know, you really want to know there's a problem and so forth, but um, the more that you can keep it real, the better you are because people are pretty savvy at reference purpose. Uh, that's, I think we talked about that. That's great for teams. It's great for organizations. It's great for you. Tell them about the plan. We know the plans actually reduce stress and it's just great to have a plan. Even if you've got to change the plan, um, so therefore tell them when the plan changes, keep them up to date. Don't let a falsehood fill that space. Um, and when the plan changes, this is part of keeping it real, no bull say, well, we've had to change the plan. And then you go, cause this is real, no bull, uh, by the way, changing the plan is perfectly normal because we didn't have all the information available that we needed when we did the plan, expect the plan to change, but in a controlled way. Reframe, tell them why the organization will be better and stronger. Tell them why they'll be better and stronger. Tell them about the opportunity, not just the threat. Um, and tell them about levels of redundancy or safety or whatever else you have. In other words, address the reality of the situation um, and give the crisis meaning, i.e. something bad's happened, here's why. It's got meaning for us as an organization and it's great. Then the communication basics come into play. Say it in more than one way, use multiple modes of communication, Repetition's fine because it reinforces and and in fact, we all forget stuff. Other things crowd our mind and messages that were delivered a while ago dissipate or disappear into the recesses of our cloudy minds because we're busy and use feedback loops. So just check in to see whether people heard the message and there are many ways to do those particular feedback loops. So as you can see, the interesting thing here, whoop, and I won't go too far, is that what you do for you and the skills you learn for you have a corollary in how you help your team stay resilient when faced with stresses and bear in mind that there are some, some home challenges for many people as well. So in summary, you need to look after yourself so you can look after others. Um, don't forget the basics. We haven't gone into it much here because there's there's plenty online and plenty of literature available uh, and they'll do it much, much better than me, um, except you have the ability to approve your response or improve your response to stress. In fact, you can assent to particular thoughts. So the way you're thinking about a particular situation may not be the most realistic or the most production and reality always wins. So, and we do have a human tendency to see the worst of a situation um, and retraining in that is particularly helpful and important. So understand you have that power and it can increase over time and reframe use that power to do so try to stress and rest and there are there are techniques to do that and it's not just taking a long break there are micro breaks that can be everything from a long weekend to compartmentalizing your worry time to taking detachment breaks to doing mini meditations there are lots available on this have a crack develop the skills many of these are actually skills they're learn skills then you're in better shape to manage your manage your team S stay connected yourself to the organization's purpose and help them stay remember in two and three how you communicate how you frame this this is part of your job as a leader how you provide the context from from which they act uh, show the team you've got a plan engage them in developing the plans a good idea keep the team up to date the plan changes bring them up to date Encourage the right basic behaviors as you go. Those four items from diet, exercise, social contact, etc. cetera. Um, ensure people feel the organization as their back. And uh, remember to just ask people if they're okay. All right. Now, on my clock, I'm out of time. And I think we are. So if you do have any questions, feel free to send them to webinar at beventongroup.com. Um, after this particular webinar, we'll have we'll be returning to more change and um, organization design and um, technology impacts to a certain extent, actually to quite a large extent on our working world for the next webinars. But it was a pleasure to deliver this one. We'll respond as best we can to your email should you send them to this email address. I wish you all a fabulous Friday and hopefully a wonderful weekend. This pack will be, a link to this pack will be sent to you and you should be able to see right in front of you there an example of some of the list of references, which I hope will be very useful to you. Thank you very much.
and we'll let you know when the next webinar happens.